So I'll start by talking a little bit about myself. Uh, first of all, good afternoon to all of you. And I hope that you're all doing safe and you're all healthy uh, wherever you are in the world right now. Uh, my name is Gunjan and I work as a data scientist at Gojek. I am a mathematician at heart. I have a bachelor's degree in mathematics and a master's degree in data science. I'm currently working at Gojek uh, since the past uh, two years and I've been working on some really exciting problems and I'm here to share one of those with you. So let me start by talking a little bit about Gojek and setting a bit of context about the problem that I'm trying to uh, showcase here. Gojek is an app that offers many services to its users, services like ordering food, commuting, digital payments, shopping, hyperlocal delivery, getting a massage, and two dozen other services are all offered in one app by Gojek. It is Indonesia's first and fastest growing Decacorn, building an on-demand empire. We have a headquarters in Jakarta, Indonesia, and Gojek operates in 207 cities in Southeast Asia. And, two, and five Southeast Asian countries, including Indonesia, Singapore, Thailand, Vietnam, and Philippines. Now, when you have so many services uh, uh, rolled into one app across so many locations, a very natural question comes up. How many people who are on our platform actually use more than one of these services? Let's assume a person, Mike, who uses our two-wheeler taxi service, GoRide, to commute to and from work every day, but has never used our car taxi service, GoCar. Hi, we have one more person. Welcome. So I was just talking a little bit about Gojek and uh, the, the place I work for right now. And then I'll go on to talking about the problem that I'm trying to solve with the poster that you see on your screen. So Gojek, uh, at Gojek, we have uh, many, many services rolled into one app. Uh, services like ordering food, commuting, digital payments, shopping, hyper-local delivery, getting a massage, and like two dozen other services all rolled into one app. So when you have so many services in one app, a very natural question comes up that how many people actually use multiple services that we offer? So let's assume a person Mike, who uses our two-wheeler taxi service, Go Ride, to commute to and from work every day, but has never used our car taxi service, Go Car. Now, does this mean that he will never use it? Or let's take the case of Indra, who religiously orders food from our Go from our food delivery service, Go Food, and uses our digital payments platform, Go Pay, to pay for them, but has never taken a ride using Go Ride or Go Car. So does it make sense for us to send her a voucher for these services to see if she uses it? Now with millions of monthly active customers, the permutations are endless. But the key point is that for us as a business, it makes sense if more and more customers use more and more services that we offer. But at the same time, we don't want to spam our customers with vouchers or services that are not relevant to them. Imagine constantly getting notifications of, uh, of a voucher from a particular app, which you have no interest in whatsoever. It can surely get very annoying. So we decided to build an algorithm that helps us figure out which customer is most likely to use which service based on their transaction history. This, mean, this meant generating a targeted campaign for our customers. By targeted campaign, I mean only sending a voucher or a cashback to a customer if they are highly probable to actually use it. This way, we get higher conversion rates at much lower cost and we don't end up spamming our customers. Um, any questions till now? You can just feel free to stop me at any point if you have any questions. Okay. So uh, let's try to zoom in to the left side of the poster and see what's going on here. So here you can see um, a Venn diagram that explains how a targeting cam targeted campaign is designed. 
So let's say we have a universe of all Gojek users. And um, out of this, there will always be a base pool of the campaign that you want to run. So let's say we want to run a campaign um, to, to convert more and more people to use our food delivery system, Go Food. Then our base pool would consist of people who are eligible for that campaign, which means people who have used other services but have not used Go Food till now. And out of this base pool, our aim is to find a target group or a target audience, which are users who are most likely to be interested in the campaign. In this case, users who are most likely to convert to becoming GoFood users. So for any targeted cross-sell, our aim is to find this targeted audience. So this is the basic problem statement that we're trying to solve. We're trying to find a targeted group of people. We're, we're trying to find a small group of people to target for a particular campaign. Uh, any questions till now about customer targeting or uh, if the diagram is not clear or anything, please feel free to ask at any point. All right, then I'll move forward. So now to solve this problem, our first hunch was to uh, build a classification model. Now, uh, a little bit about what a classification model is. A classification model is an algorithm that is designed to divide your data set into two or more classes if such classes exist. So in our case, we had two very clear classes that existed in our data set. So for our base pool, what we're trying to do is classify our users into two classes, customers who will cross sell and customers who will not cross sell. And we can only look at the customers who will cross sell and send the voucher to those people, avoiding a, a huge bunch of people uh, from that voucher. Now classification model, uh, when we built it, it was working great. We were getting like an average uplift for around 5x on natural conversion rates on one of our key services. But at the same time, classification model had some of its pitfalls. So to actually build a classification algorithm for a targeted campaign, we needed to train the model individually for each campaign because the base pool itself for each campaign would change. If I want to run a campaign to target new GoFood users, then my base pool would consist of people who have used other services except GoFood. Whereas if I want to run a campaign to target go car, new go car users, then my base pool would be people who have used other services except go car. So the base pool is itself changing for each model, for each um, cross sell campaign. Now, when that happens, you, you literally need to rebuild your classification model for each and every campaign that you want to run. So clearly this was not a scalable approach to go about it. So we needed to sort of rethink the way we were approaching this problem and think of it as making a matchmaking, like, like literally a match between users and customers such that we have an algorithm that is generic enough to actually, um, that that is generic enough to just so, such that we don't need to uh, have a lot of effort to go from one target one targeted cross sell model to another. That's when we thought of using recommendation systems to solve this problem. Now, a recommendation system is an algorithm that uses users' past behavior or users' history to recommend items that to, to users that they're most likely to purchase. In today's world, recommendation systems are literally all around us. You see relevant ads, relevant products on Amazon, relevant shows and movies on Netflix. All of these have recommendation systems sitting behind them. We are using recommendation systems based on collaborative filtering as a matchmaking mechanism between users and products. Since we have many different products, we can actually use these products as different items in a recommendation system place that we want to recommend to our users. I'm going to take a pause here for two minutes to see if there are any more questions. Oh, 
Okay, cool. Okay, I don't, I don't see any questions. I'll move on. So, um, I was talking about recommendation systems. So, like I said, we are using recommendation systems to recommend products, or or we're treating each of our services as one item in a recommendation system. Now, every recommendation system that is based on collaborative filtering has a utility matrix associated with it. A utility matrix is a matrix that captures interactions between users and items. By interactions, I mean uh, these, these could be um, the rating that a user has given to an item, or this could be the purchase history of that user and that item. This could be the search history. This could be how many times a user has clicked an item, etc. This is what our utility matrix look like. So each column of the matrix is one service. This is like a sample of our utility matrix, of course. Each column of the utility matrix is one service and each row is a customer. Now these columns can go as granular as having a merchant as something that we're recommending. So the cross sell model can actually work to, uh, to the granularity level of a merchant, not just a service or a payment method. So the matrix is filled like this. We have, um, we were looking at the transaction history of a user for that particular pro product. So let's say user one has used GoFood in the last one month, three times. So the cell between user one and GoFood will be filled with three. Similarly, user two has used GoFood two times and the cell between these two will be filled with two. However, user three has not used GoFood in the past one month. So this cell will be empty. Now imagine this concept being applied across millions of customers and uh, more than 20, 30 products. So we would have a pretty huge utility matrix at, at our hands. And the idea is that this matrix is going to be very, very sparse. By sparse, I mean most of the values of this matrix will be missing because as I said, we have a lot of users, but not everybody uses all the services. So wherever a person is not using a service, that particular cell will be empty. So the problem eventually boils down to finding these missing values in the matrix. Now, if we are able to find these missing values in this matrix, we will be able to figure out whether this particular user will be interested in this particular product in the future or not. So let's say we have a value for user one against GoCar. Let's say we're able to predict what this value is. If this value is very, very small, we might not want to recommend GoCar to this user. However, if the predicted value is very high, we might want to recommend GoCar to this user and include that person in the campaign. Now, for the purposes of this poster, I'm going to uh, ask you to consider rec like recommendation systems as a black box. I'm not going to go into too much detail about how the algorithm works, etc. But just to give you an intuitive idea, we can try to understand the image here. So as you can see, user one and user three both have very similar behaviors. Both of them have used Go, Go Ride and GoPay Offline. And both of them have used GoPay Offline once. And user one has used Go Ride thrice. And user three has used Go Ride four times. Now, this is pretty similar behavior in the past one month. However, user one seemed to also have used Go Food thrice. Now, what we can do is recommend Go Food to user three as well, because we have seen that in the past, user one and user three have actually behaved similarly. So, if there is a service that user one is using, we can actually use that information to recommend it to user three. So, this is the basic idea behind how recommendation systems work. They, they work on finding similarities between users and similarities between products based on the past behavior. Uh, any questions till now? All right. So 
like i said let's treat recommendation systems as a black box and uh, moving forward this is what our final workflow looks like we get our data our one month transaction history from bigquery we feed this data into pandas and do some uh, etl on it now doing etl on pandas is like to get a utility matrix out of the raw data is not a very expensive operation so pandas simply on its own was working really well for it so we decided to go ahead with that however building a recommendation system on the utility matrix is quite an expensive operation we're not only storing the entire utility matrix in memory but we're also trying to perform optimizations on top of it so we started off by trying out the li a library called surprise from python in python uh, which was uh, being used to build our recommendation system and it was taking around 6 to 7 hours to just build one recommendation system so after exploring more we found that there is a spark ml library as well which deals with recommendation system and when we tried using that with a python wrapper on it we found that our training time had reduced from 6 uh, hours to 1 hour so we finally end up ended up using the spark ml uh, ls recommendation engine with a python wrapper on top of it and that library basically uh, spits out your final filled in utility matrix from which we can infer the list of customers to target now once we had this workflow in place uh, we decided to do some field tests on the model to see if it is actually how how it actually performs out there in the field and uh, we got an uplift of uh, around 5x to 7x on natural conversion rates across service types and currently also this model is being used to uh, target a lot of people like you to to send out a lot of uh, vouchers for cross selling across products that's uh, about it from me uh, that's a brief intro to the project that i'm i've done there is a relevant blog post uh, about this that i will be posting on the discord channel in a bit so please feel free to go through it and i'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have hi i see someone new has joined how are you doing Hi, hi. Yeah, yeah. I'm doing fine. Thanks. Um, I was. Okay. Uh, I actually just uh, finished talking about the poster right before you joined. Yes. So, uh, like, feel free to ask any questions that you might have. If there's any section that's not clear, I'll be happy to talk about it again. Yeah, amazing. I was um, I was in between talks basically, and, okay. and I missed um, I missed the the, the beginning. Um, right. I'm, really, I'm really sorry about that. Let me just um, no, turn on. No problem at all. Let me turn on the video. Hi. Interested by the by the poster. I, I reviewed it before before the call because I knew I I'm, I was not going to have like much much time, mm -hmm. and uh, I saw that you were using um, uh, the the Spark ALS um, uh, like model basically. Yes. And um, and I was wondering if. Um, in your in your setup with uh, the recommendation you were you were working on, uh, if your products were changing uh, quite often, or if you had a, kind of a stable set of products, um, because I was thinking of using also ALS for I tried ALS on my on my own uh, problem um, on a, on a couple of them actually, like some to do um, to find similar users, some to find um, similar products. Uh, Etc. And and I have one use case in mind, but uh, for that use case, the uh, the like from like basically one week to another, the products are are changing. Mm. So I was wondering, uh, you know, if if I could make that work, or and and how how was your situation basically? Okay, so currently this model is not a real time model. It is trained on a weekly basis. So the products are not changing on a weekly basis, but customers are being added on a weekly basis. That happens. Like you get, we get more and as our customer base expands, we get more and more customer customers being added to the model. So um, and this is not a model that is even pre predicting results real time because this is currently used to generate campaigns. Now those campaigns are usually pre-planned. 
so uh, how it works is whenever a product comes up to us and asks us to uh, give them a you know list of customers to target for a particular campaign we just sort of use a pre-trained model for that particular week and give them the list of customers to target for that model for that campaign so it is not really real time but if a weekly uh, if a weekly sort of retraining works for you then you can definitely uh, do something like this yeah because uh, so in our case um, i like i was just uh, talking before we were, we started using the surprise package when we actually started building the recommendation system there is a surprise package in python which we started with but there the problem was that the training time was around 6 to 7 hours which was a uh, pretty huge uh, and like it was just not optimal enough for us so then we moved on we explored spark a little bit and we found out that this has an als package in it and our training time actually reduced to around 1 hour after we started using uh, spark yeah so that was uh, that was pretty uh, that was pretty useful for us that way yeah but yeah. I'm, i'm not sure how this would uh, work real time if that's your use case yeah i mean i've used i've used the ls um like successfully for a use case similar to yours where i have um like my users where like basically i want to match make users and and entities that they follow mm -hmm. basically so mm -hmm. i have user profiles with all the entities that they follow and that's pretty that's pretty stable and thanks to als i can i can use that i forgot the name of them in the api but like you can you can get like the um, uh the like the 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 relationships or like the i forgot the name but you can basically it's like with this market basket model right so you can get you can basically get the the next entities um that the user is yeah 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 could so, follow. They, so that, that the probability would, score for the users who yeah. would who's the next entity yeah i get that yeah, yeah. So that that was that was like working and I was quite happy with that but mm -hmm. now I'm I'm looking at the other one which is more like um kind of like e-commerce um okay. recommendation use mm -hmm. case where you have these products that changes and for that one I'm I'm a bit uh, yeah I'm a bit stuck but I will uh, I will I will kind of keep keep on keep on thinking about this I was I was thinking of maybe in order to be able to use ALS um kind of find like the similarities between the products or something like this um and then do the recommendations based on that or something like that but i'm not sure how will how will that will work but but yeah mm. okay because then then if you could say like you know if the products are, are more or less um similar which in my case i mean to some extent they are so then i could maybe um instead of match making a user with a product directly i could match make the user with the the let's say the the archetype of the product or something like this um hmm. but then i would need to define these things and yeah so i think uh, like we also faced uh, a similar problem but the the thing with us so the the upside that you have is that if you're working in an e-commerce space your product similarities actually make sense like if a, a person is sen selling a type of clothing then there would be other people selling similar type of clothing so you would have something uh, which could be used called a similar product but for us what we had was services that are offered by gojek now it's very absurd to say that go food is similar to go car or like a food delivery platform is similar to go um a uh, you know car hailing service so that was kind of one of the challenges that we faced so we actually we ended up using matrix factorization technique for this very reason we we started by using knn approaches we tried uh, that, those but there also like it 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 just doesn't make sense to say that okay one product is similar to the other in our case users can be similar based on their uh, usage history etc but it it's there's no such thing as a product profile that we can use to you know create similar products as such so okay really um, interesting that that's that's sort of where uh, als has helped us because um using matrix factorization using als has sort of uh, helped us cross that uh, kind of blocker that we had because it uses both user and item similarities so it's like a combination of both yeah yeah definitely sounds great yeah yeah thanks thanks actually actually i had on my list to check um to check more like the product similarity um techniques for that thing like and for the k and i saw the 
this Hanoi library that I have not used yet. Um, okay. So I'm, I might, I'm just going to make a note like actually what you said is uh, makes sense. Like the LS is more for the, when you can, when you can train on that relationship between the two and less mm -hmm. on the, uh, yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks a lot for, yeah, Thank I have you. to, I have to run story to add another talk, but. Um, sure, sure. Thank you but for I'm, joining. I'm, I'm, I'm happy I, I caught you and could, could ask my question. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Hello. Hi. Can I ask a question? Hey. Yes. Please go ahead. It's Mark. Hi. Um, so you you spoke about um, the differences in learning time between the two uh, packages. The first one you were saying was six to seven hours, and the the second one was much shorter. I think you said about an hour. Um, but apart from the speed of concluding that process, did you determine any particular differences in the, the, the types of outcome of those learnings, or was it purely just a speed benefit that, that drove you to the mm -hmm. second package? That's a very good question. So um, before I answer that, I, I'll talk about something that something that was essentially different between the two algorithms, uh, between Surprise and the Spark ML library. So um, recommendation engines, uh, as an entity, they work on explicit data. By explicit data, I mean uh, data where you have a rating given by a user to a particular item. So, for example, in Netflix, you have the rating given by a user on an, uh, for a particular movie or a TV show. And you use that explicit feedback to train your model. However, in our case, we didn't have that. So, what uh, Spark ML library, ALS library does is that it converts the explicit data into implicit data. Uh, sorry, it converts the implicit data into explicit data first. What we had was implicit data. It was user transaction history. It doesn't necessarily indicate how a user likes or dislikes an item. Surprise did not have that conversion. It was assuming that our implicit, that the data we're giving it is actually explicit data. So the, it was working on this underlying assumption, which was not really true for us. Now, when we moved to Spark, this is also one of the benefits that we had, um, which was that it was converting our explicit, implicit data to explicit data. It was converting it into a probability uh, score with a confidence saying that, okay, if this person is using so-and-so service X number of times, I can say that this is the probability that he or she likes this service. So the explicitness of liking or disliking a service was coming uh, using that library. So uh, overall, it kind of enriched the uh, process. And yes, our results were also like our accuracy numbers were much better using the Spark ML uh, library as compared to the surprise package because of this one enrichment that the model was doing. Okay, that's really interesting. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. All right, guys, it's time. I am going to drop off and uh, I'll be there hanging out at Discord for a while. If you guys have any questions, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thank you for joining. Bye-bye.